Hello, Mid-American Gardeners. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna talk about all things plants, so stay tuned. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. So I might handle some cut flower questions or maybe even perennials. But there are three talented gentlemen here with me today. Let's find out what their expertise is and maybe they'll do an email. So Mark Kemp, I'm gonna start with you first. Okay, my name is Mark Kemp and I'm a landscape architect. Um, the first uh, question I have here was sent in by a viewer and they write, uh, is there a record for how big a rose bush gets? Um, here's a photo of mine that's uh, over nine feet tall. Um, the interesting thing is there, there's, there's somewhat records. Uh, the Guinness Book of Records has one listed at 18 feet, seven inches. Um, Tombstone, Arizona has a uh, climbing rose that's considered 8,000 plus square feet and their self-proclaimed largest rose there, there is. Um, but what I thought the interesting thing on this question was, is what type? I mean, nine feet for your shrub rose is, or bush rose is probably exceeding its range of growth. And you often get the question, well, it's a dwarf. Well, a lot of times dwarf means it's just a smaller version of something larger as a parent. So. Um, it is important on knowing what you're planting, whether it's a miniature or a bush or a dwarf of a much larger, but uh, nine feet sounds like a pretty spectacular size. Um, but if it was a climbing rose, it would be paled in comparison. So. <laughs> we did have adequate moisture in the spring, if not excessive. So yes. I think that might have helped. That was a great um, thing to send into the show. So thank you and thank you, Mark. And now let's go to Rusty Malding in the middle. Thanks, Diane. You're welcome. My name is Rusty Malding. Uh, my wife, Corey, and I own a small landscape company in Watsika, Illinois. Um, I'm also uh, current president of the Illinois Landscape Contractors uh, Association. So today, uh, to start with, we have a, a few pictures for you to look at. Um, it's, it's fall, uh, and if you haven't cut back your perennials yet, I just have a couple of things to talk about. Um, so in general, there's reasons to cut things back and reasons not to cut things back. Uh, and this particular uh, picture, which you're looking at, is uh, some heuchera and some geraniums. Those are what we refer to as semi-evergreen. Uh, and so they'll retain the, the leaves throughout the, the winter. Uh, they'll stay, kind of keep their color. Uh, the geraniums actually have nice fall color, so we don't cut those back. That next one was the um, uh, echinacea or coneflower. A lot of times we try to leave the coneflower because it's a, it's a food source for birds over the winter. They'll come in and eat seeds. So instead of going to your local hardware store and buying bird feed, uh, just leave your echinacea up. The next one are grasses. Um, ornamental grasses are in general something we leave for structure, for architecture. Uh, it adds a little winter interest. So give those until the spring. Think like early April, late March, and start cutting those back. This, this next shot is kind of a, an interesting combination of two different types. You've got some, uh, some uh, carex or, or sedges there in front as an ice dance. And then behind it, you can, might be able to pick it out as a, um, as an astilbe. Now, the carex will actually stay evergreen or semi-evergreen over the winter. So leave them, you know, add a little, some, add a little spice for your landscape. And that, uh, that astilbe has really a striking um, architecture to it. And so we tend to leave those as long as they're in good shape and will stand up. Now, what do you cut back? Um, we always try to cut back anything that has a foliar disease or something that, that may be something that would be a harbor, uh, uh, breeding ground, so to speak, for um, an insect or a pest, uh, fungus. So uh, that was a coreopsis. The coreopsis had pretty significant uh, uh, powdery mildew, uh, peonies are, are ripe to cut back, get the foliage out of there. You can compost it, get it, get it up and um, uh, nice and hot if you do, um, grind it up, but take it away from the plant. There's a very good chance they're gonna get powdery mildew next year as well, but it does uh, at least maybe give you a little bit longer before that, it, that disease comes in. The only other one I can think of is iris. I, and I, I thought about iris, but yeah, cut them back. Just the garden German iris, not the yeah. Siberian. Yeah. That was a great way to show people what they should and shouldn't cut back. So well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now let's go to Dr. Jim Appleby next to me, AKA Dr. Pest. Yes, I'm Dr. Pest. <laughs> anyway, I'm an entomologist in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences here at the University of Illinois. So I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. 
Uh, Diane, I brought in a large nest here. This Ooh. is the nest of the bald-faced hornet. And you know, we're all interested in biological control. And I, why don't we take advantage of these natural insect control that we have right in the garden? And uh, the bald-faced hornet will feed on a large variety of different caterpillars, which often destroy our crops. They also feed on uh, flies, sometimes on other wasps, like the um, yellow jacket, which generally is the one that stings us. Mm -hmm. So we really ought to um, let these go and not, not damage them in any way. Uh, let me just describe the life history of this. At this time of year in November, these uh, nests are empty now. It's the only the uh, fertilized females that overwinter, and they'll overwinter in protected areas like logs, uh, sometimes in sheds, something like that, under bark. And then in the spring, the fertilized female will go out and search out for a, a nice branch like this to, to make a, a nest, I mean, a, a, you know, start the nest. And then she'll deposit eggs in a few cells. Those larvae she feeds, and then they will develop as adults. And that will be those adults then that start building the nest. And it will keep getting larger and larger, and she'll keep laying more eggs, and the population continues to increase. Then in about the uh, month of August or early September, she'll produce a young that will develop into males and females. Those males and females will mate, and those females then are the ones that will be the fertilized queens that overwinter. And they don't overwinter inside this this thing, they overwinter outside. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the life history of the insect, and uh, you know, they were the first paper makers. Well, it's, it's just really fascinating and it's beautiful. texture. Actually, it's beautiful. So, you know, you can collect these at this time of year. Uh, all of the workers die when you get the first killing frost. So, uh, you know, we've had some killing frost now. So these are empty, and you can collect them at this time of year. It's, they're sort of a, you know, a nice nature piece that you can put in your living room. Yes, someone I know has several in our house. Yeah. So. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and now I'm feeling better about collecting them because I know there's <laughs> nothing in there. <laughs> wow. Well, it is quite attractive. You, it's amazing, that work of art. So and thank the, you for... And they're a biological control agency. Well, yeah. thanks for enlightening us on that. So people do, don't, you know, they encourage them versus oh. getting rid of them. Can oh, we show just one? Sure, you can show them. Yeah, let's let's show a close up here of the uh, of the uh, photographs. That top one is the adult of the bald faced hornet, and then the lower one is the yellow jacket. And so the bald faced hornet will also feed on yellow jackets. So they act as a biological control. The yellow jacket, uh, little yellow jackets, they make their nest in the soil. So uh, generally, an old bowl bowl uh, hole they'll develop in, and they put their nest in that. So. They're soil drilling, whereas the uh, bald-faced hornet makes those big nests in the trees and shrubs. Okay, thank you very much. That helped us to see the close-ups. Okay, let's go to a, a segment called Did You Know Next. 34 to 36 million Christmas trees are produced each year, and 95% are shipped or sold directly from Christmas tree farms. Ah, it's getting close to that time of the year for Christmas trees. We are waiting for your phone calls, so if you want to give us a call, that would be great. But we do have one, so let's go to Judy's call on line two, and it's about an iris. Hi, Judy. Hi. Uh, I was given six pots of irises. They're big uh, purple bearded irises, and they're still in the pots. And I was wondering, should I leave those like that till the spring, or put them in the ground now, or should they be indoors in a garage, or what do you think, how should I handle that? Okay, either of you want to, I'll jump in if you guys don't, so go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, it's interesting, Diane, I, I actually got a, a, a um, uh, was asked a question similar to this mm -hmm. with a small fruit tree uh, just last week. Uh, in general, I'd say if, if they're a live plant and they're perennial or they're hardy outside, Get them in the ground. Um, it's not frozen yet. It's fine to still plant most things. Uh, there are a few trees and things like that that maybe wouldn't do so well, but uh, that's it's a very small number. In general, if you've got it, go ahead and plant it. Uh, it water it in once now, and that may be all you have to do. So if it's looking good, I wouldn't let it 
ling languish yeah, in a pot. Right. Okay, that's exactly what I was going to say too. Okay, well I think we have another phone uh, call coming in. I'm going to wait to see what it is and we can go to line something and see what our next phone call is. Let's go to line three next and see what we have for us. Line three. Oh, he's not there. Okay. Well, I am going to go to the mag quiz and we're going to wait for a phone call to come up. So let's go to our quiz for Mid-American Gardener feature next. What is the common name of Aranthus hymalis? A. Winter Aconite B. Winter Iris C. Winter Jasmine D. Winter Oxalis A. Winter Aconite And you could plant winter aconite. It's a, a little bit on the late side, but I think you could plant those. They are beautiful, cheerful yellow, very early bulbs in the spring. Okay, line three, Hazel is with us and she has a hydrangea question. Hi, Hazel. Hi. What's your question? Uh, I was given a hydrangea in bloom for my 90th birthday. Oh my, recently. congratulations. Thank you. And I was wondering how to take care of it through the winter. Okay, you've got some experts here, so let's look over to the side. Through the winter? Through the winter. Um, Gonna have to find a, out what I, kind I, it I is. I guess, yeah, we need to know, is it a florist uh, hydrangea? Right. It, or is it something that can be planted outside? Uh, well, it, it came from a florist. Okay. Okay, I think that's probably yeah. where we go with it. Go ahead. Um, yeah, a lot of those are more for flower production. Um, kind of forced into that situation to be given as a gift at that time. They're not not necessarily always that hardy for the outside environment as we would know them. Um, but I think you can enjoy it. So sure. keeping it, just don't overwater it. Probably water it to touch. So you feel just down underneath the soil and if it's sopping wet, wait. I think a lot of people overwater and that they kill with kindness, I think, um, in the in the winter time, that's just a high light. Try to find a good sunny mm -hmm. window. Yeah, that's a nice uh, southern exposure is, is good. And and yeah, and if you can. Enjoy it indoors. Uh, it, it may stop flower production, um, but if you can kind of keep it going, uh, you can set it outside in your back patio in, in the spring after the danger of frost is over. And enjoy it some more. Right, so. absolutely. Well, congratulations. Thank you for your call. And I hope that lives for a long time good 10 years and then you can have it for your 100th birthday. Okay, let's go on to Virginia's question. She's on line two and has a, a blue spruce question. Hi, Virginia. Hi, I have a blue spruce, <coughs> excuse me, in my backyard and about from starting from the bottom, about halfway up, it's lost all its needles this year. I don't see any bagworms on it. I looked out there today and it looked like the tree is green all the way up. The, and I was wondering if you could tell me anything about it. So the, the entire bottom branches are brown and dying off? No, they're green. Okay. They just don't have any needles on them. Oh, so the branch is green, but there's no needles. Right. Oh. So that would be needleless in, in yes. our book. Okay. And so it's not the interior. I mean, you still, there's no growth out on the, the outer edges. No. Okay. I looked out there today and I thought, why is it so green when there's no needles on it? If it's if it's starting at the bottom, there there is a there is a and I am failing to remember the name of the disease, but there's a, there's a, a disease that will cause the um, spruce trees once they hit to be about somewhere around 20 years old. Mm -hmm. It seems like they, they typically attack those uh, at, at that maturity, uh, and they'll start limbing them up at, at year after year mm -hmm. and slowly working its way off. Um, the best thing you can do is probably actually remove those branches and try to remove some of the inoculum um, and keep them watered well in through July and August, fertilize them a little bit. Uh, there, there may be a fungicide uh, application and I'm, I am blanking right now, so, uh, but those, those things are reasonable steps to take. Mm -hmm. And there are some needle cast diseases that affect the needles and, and they generally affect the lower branches because that's where the more moisture is and those fungi tend to uh, be more of a problem when you have high moisture content. So and that needle drop or the needle loss will happen first, um, and then you'll get you know the mm -hmm. branches themselves 
and getting brittle and dying back. So I think if you uh, give more circulation, air circulation, by removing those dead branches, that would help the situation some. Okay, so hopefully that helps. We all chimed in. Well, three of the four of us chimed in. I did notice on planting a windbreak this year that spruce did not like the change in temper uh, change in moisture levels mm. as much as pines and other. So they're a little bit more particular. Temperamental. Temperamental, there's the word. <laughs> okay, so thank you for that question, Virginia. Let's go to line six, and Glenn's got a question about an aloe vera plant. Hi, Glenn. Hi, how are you? Doing great. Um, I have a silly question. Um, no question is silly. I was silly. Aloe vera plant, and it was near dead. I should have threw it out, but I cut it off with scissors, and it's coming back up right now, and I went to the field, and I put some lime on it, and I don't know if the lime is going to hurt it or not, but it's growing very well right now, and I guess my question is, is the lime going to hurt it? and how much should I water it? So now, is this an indoor plant? I'm trying to visualize. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. It sounded like it just kind of ran its course and you rejuvenated it by cutting it back, which is, there's a lot of perennials and shrubs that you can do that with as well. So right. the lime, without knowing what your soil you know, uh, test would tell you the lime was probably not necessary um, if it was just a little bit it's probably going to be okay just water it as normal not too much not too little did you put very much on it or was it just a Say small amount probably around a teaspoon oh okay or, yeah or a teaspoon. Okay. It, you'll, you'll be fine it'll yeah. be fine yeah Al aloe vera is a pretty tough plant uh, you can do a lot of things to it and uh, they keep on coming back but I don't know that it needs to be, I don't know that it would have needed to be limed, but um, if you didn't put very much on it, I just wouldn't lime it any more. And if it looks like it's suffering, then leach, I mean, it'll put water through it just one time well and see if that will take care of it. But I bet it comes back and is fine. Yeah. yeah. So, so there you go. Thank you for your question about aloe vera. And now let's go to a rhubarb question. And Lois has that for us on line five. Hi, Lois. Hi. I was just wondering, when is the best time to uh, transplant rhubarb? You know, mine's getting pretty big and I want to divide it up. When would be the best time? Okay, we're that's, all kind of looking that's, around. That's, that's, that's not something I have a whole lot of experience with. <laughs> uh, I think Any we ideas? need Chuck Boyd here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Chuck. <laughs> right. um, well, it's, it's a perennial, so yeah. I, yeah. I would think you'd be able to still do it now or in the spring or early, if it right? could have been September October yeah in the spring you will set back I mean that's when it's sending up the right, shoots that's its most aggressive. so you may want to wait almost three-fourths of a year half of a year uh, but if you don't mind if it's so big that you, but I would not sacrifice the rhubarb stalks for dividing it and then divide it after that, I think that would be the way to go. Hmm. And if it's uh, if there's more to it, we'll ask uh, Chuck Voigt to clarify because he's really good at talking about that. Okay, we have one more thing about the uh, 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 nest preservation, which I think might tie in with yours. So let's go to Jane's uh, comment on line three. Hi, Jane. Uh, yes, this is this is Jean. Oh, Jean. Hi, Jean. Hi. I'm, uh, I have a uh, paper wasp nest that we discovered when all the leaves came off the, our little uh, maple tree, and I want to preserve it, and I know there are still some, with this, when these warm days come around, why the wasps, wasps, some of the wasps are buzzing around yet, but I understand that the queen uh, leaves and doesn't come back then finally. So would it be safe to take the nest down after we have a deep freeze uh, or what, what is the, the safest way to do it to have it and preserve it and not have wasps in my house? Well uh, you can do that uh, after the first killing frost so uh, uh, right after the killing frost then you can bring it in and keep it dry and it will you know stay for years and years. So this paper wasp is it actually a hornet? Is it something different? She well, said paper wasp nest. Well, well, I think it's the same one That's that we what showed I was here, the bald-faced hornet, the okay. ones that build the great big ones. The other ones are the uh, paper wasps, like this little one here. 
This is the paper yeah. wasp. And nobody wants to preserve that, I don't think. <laughs> well, they probably, you know, it's not that beautiful. But, but uh, yeah, you can just uh, keep them dry. And uh, I'm a little surprised that you find wasps around there because I have several of the bald-faced hornet and they've all, they're all dead now. But we had a pretty bad frost um, okay. just a few days ago. So. All right, so she can, she doesn't really have to do anything unless she wants to no, do some. Yeah. I mean, if you're concerned, bring them in the garage, you know. But I don't think you're going to have a problem at all. They okay. all leave the, uh, uh, the nest. There's nothing in the nest then. Okay. Very good. Let's go to uh, some emails next, and we're going to start back with you, Mark. Okay. Um, I have a question here that comes from uh, uh, Ricky Harris. Uh, they have a honey, honeysuckle hedge uh, that has a problem with leaves from about 6 to 12 inches in from the end of the plant turning brown. Um, and they're curious on um, not the, you know, what to do with that and the health of the plant. A lot of times you'll find that plants, if there's not an obvious reason like mildew um, or you know, a an, an more obvious disease, uh, you, it'll go through different things like drought. Um, I think this was sent in late June. Um, that would have been early in the, the summer's drought, but uh, plants will shed leaves to uh, get through that stress. Um, if you don't see other obvious uh, symptoms, like scouting through it, um, of like insects like scale or something like that that might cause some leaf drop, uh, the best thing to do is, is just kind of keep it from going through those stresses. Another thing that might be a possibility too is that how hedges are trimmed will kind of cause shade, um, will take light away from those interior leaves, and then thus they'll shed those off. So, the proper pruning of a hedge will allow air movement and light to get in and give you just a little bit healthier of a plant. Um, other than that, just uh, kind of scout for other things that might cause that. Okay, thank you, Mark. And now, Rusty. All right, thank you. Uh, Sue Ann wrote to us from Joliet, Illinois. Uh, she, her neighbor has a hackberry tree that uh, has leaves falling in, in her side of the lawn. Uh, and uh, she's wondering, uh, and noticed that it has gall, and she's wondering if she should mulch them or not. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that the, the gall is actually uh, probably the hackberry nipple gall. It's a small little gall. It looks like the end of an eraser on a number two pencil poking out of the bottom side of the leaves. Uh, it's very, very common, and it really poses no, no detrimental effect to the trees. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, uh, the gall is caused by a psyllid, and um, they have actually already left the gall at this point in time of the year. They probably made their way into your home, potentially, or your neighbor's homes. Um, and so mulch away. Uh, you're, anything you do with those leaves, you can kind of leave them wherever, and it's going to have no impact on uh, the gall production next year. So mulching leaves on site, put them in a mulch in the compost pile. Uh, grind them up and throw them back on your beds. Anything you can do to, to reuse that, that great resource, have at it. I think that's a, that's a great thing to do. So no worries. No worries at all. Okay, there are a lot of reports about galls on a myriad of trees this year. So mostly cosmetic. Yep, absolutely. Okay. All right, thank you very much. And now let's go to you, Dr. Jim. Well, we had a question from Bonnie Schoen. She uh, wanted to know about milky spore, the treatment for Japanese beetles using milky spore to the, onto the lawn. You gotta remember that Japanese beetles are, are winged insects, and so even though, Bonnie, you would treat your lawn with milky spore, I would say, uh, you know, they can fly in from your neighbor's area, so I, I really don't think you'll, I, I don't think you'll be very happy if you use milky spore. There's been a lot of reports that it's not very effective. So I'm afraid that you're going to still have to use uh, seven to control the adults. And in general, the last several years in the Midwest, we really have had a rather low infestation of Japanese beetles, so there is some hope. If you start treating, though, be sure that you treat as soon as you see the first adult because if you don't, that adult will say to the other adults in the area, hey, come on, this is a great host plant. So get the first one under control. Is it cyclical when it moves into a new area or why has it decreased? Well, we don't know exactly why it has decreased. I know I'm, I'm, my parents are from Ohio and many years ago, it was a terrible pest in Ohio. Now okay. it's pretty well under control. So I think 
natural parasites and predators will catch up with the insect. Okay, because so. it was horrible maybe three, four. Yes, it was. Even five years ago yeah. and not so much lately. So that's good news. Thank that you, Jim. That is good news, right. Okay, well, it really goes fast. It's amazing how we started slow with the questions, but I think people caught up. So we appreciate you as viewers when you do send in either emails or write us and then also call in because it's fun to see what's going on out in your gardening, out in your garden area. Well, we'll still be gardening even though it's fall, so we are still going to be here each week. And I want to thank you three for being here and for answering all of your questions. And so um, we hope that you will have a great week gardening. Goodbye.